Dr. Jean Twangy. Welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you. It's uh, it's fantastic having you on, Dr. Twangy. You've it's written great to be uh, here. Yeah, yeah. You've written so many. I had no idea how many successful books you'd actually written. I was familiar with your work for my gen because it was quoted everywhere in so many other the other books that I had read in the last several years. But uh, you've done this a number of times now. What uh, is this like your seventh book or something? Well, I've written some textbooks too. Um, this is my fourth one on generational differences and cultural change. Mm. So you wrote iGen, which was on Generation Z, the Zoomers. Mm -hmm. You wrote one on the Millennials. Yeah. You wrote one on narcissism. That's which right. Covered aspects of millennials. So anyway, you've written a lot, and we're going to get into all of those books because this latest book that you've written, the title is Generations. The subtitle is The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and Silence, and What They Mean for, for America's Future is self-explanatory. That's what we're actually going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. And I told you that you know, structuring this conversation is a bit challenging. One, because the questions are endless. I just found myself at one point um, writing so many questions that I knew that not only we're not going to get to them, but I felt like at that point it was really about how to structure it. But then when I tried to structure the conversation, I realized we're going to be jumping around everywhere. So I don't know how much of it's going to be chronological or not. But before we get into this conversation, which I'm excited to have with you, I have one question about your background, which is how do you describe what you do and how did you get interested in studying generational differences? Yeah, so... Yeah, generational differences is usually the easiest, you know, shorthand to explain it. So um, I first got interested in this topic when I was an undergraduate working on my college honors thesis, and I was interested in gender and gender roles. And I gave some of my classmates at the University of Chicago a questionnaire that looked at stereotypically masculine and feminine personality traits. This is a question that was written in the early 70s, and I was handing it out in the early 90s or so. And I noticed that the scores were really different, especially for um, the for women than the 1970s test manual said they should be. Um, a lot more of my classmates were saying that they were assertive and felt like they had leadership skills and so on. And at first I thought I was scoring it wrong, but I wasn't. Um, and then I got the same result the next year at the University of Michigan when I was in grad school with a, a big sample of undergraduates and in intro psych. And I realized, you know, that's probably a generational difference. You know, think about the changes in gender roles and women's roles over that 20 year period. So then I ended up going and finding um, all the research articles that had used that scale. And there was this very, very pronounced and very linear increase in particularly in women um, describing themselves as assertive and as leaders. And so that was my first paper on generational differences. What was your goal or what, what, what goal did you have in your mind when you set out to write this book? So my number one goal really was to dial down to the real differences among generations to help all of us understand each other better. Because there's so many stereotypes and myths and rumors about generations. And I, th I just thought it was very important to try to figure out, well, what can we really find out if we dig into the best survey data available where people are describing their, their own experiences and themselves and their own feelings and attitudes? What can we find out? So who are the people that typically study this topic? Is it demographers? Is it sociologists? Like what's the field? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's it's a it's kind of an odd field. Um, when I first got interested in generational differences, there was not a, a lot of academic research on them. There were theories, there were lots of books and articles with observations, maybe they'd have some census data, but they would often make guesses about what the actual psychological differences were. So early 90s, when I was first getting into this, people were trying to figure out my own generation, Gen X, we were the young ones at the time. And you know, these books and articles would say things like, oh, Gen Xers have low self-esteem. They wouldn't actually have any proof of that. And I was in grad school learning about how you measure self-esteem. And it was surprising to me they they just said it and didn't back it up. Um, so that's one one thing that that got me interested in the field because I didn't see very much at all 
in my own field in psychology that had dug into generational differences. There were a few things here and there from sociologists, but there was, and mostly that was about attitudes, very little of it was um, about psychological traits. Um, and as a grad student, this is what you want. You want a field that is very interesting, but doesn't have a lot of research and generational differences turned out to be that field. Yeah, I love the, the example that you brought up with Gen X. One, because it taught me something that I didn't know, which was that Coke had released a product called No <laughs> or something like that, that uh, appealed to Generation X based on the stereotypes that actually weren't accurate. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, and I, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the product too, but it basically the marketing was like black and white pictures and it was all depressing. And yeah, it really missed the boat. It didn't sell because yeah, it was really based on that uh, you know idea that generate that Gen Xers were all depressed and low self esteem. And turns out that's not true. Gen Xers actually had higher self esteem as high school and college students than boomers did at the same age. Yeah, I remember the artwork reminding me of the film rendition of 1984 or something like that. <laughs> I didn't go back to compare it, but it was an interesting. Interesting thing. So is there a traditional way that um, people who study this field look at it? Well, I mean, the, there's a traditional theory around generations. So the first theories said that generational differences happen because people experience major events at different ages. So things like wars, terrorist attacks, pandemics, you have big stuff that happens. And sure, that has somewhat of an impact, but... You know, I, I've always been a little skeptical of that because in the long term, that's not really what has the biggest impact on people's day-to-day -day lives. So when I started in this field, I realized, you know, one thing that had an impact was just changes in values and cultural changes. So the growth of individualism, more focused on the self and less on others. But then with this book, um, it was in which really started with iGen, my book about Gen Z, I realized, you know, it's technology. And not just technology like smartphones and social media and the internet, but as a broader definition, things like better medical care and labor-saving devices and air conditioning and faster transportation. I mean, those are the things that make living now so different from living 150 years ago or even 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. Mm. Yeah, no, I I mean, I can't wait to get to that part of the conversation because it's something that we talked about on the show before in other contexts, specifically with labor saving devices in the home and how that was a big part of the liberation of women and their time and their ability to to gain independence, which I, it's something that once you look at it, you're like, oh, that makes sense. But if you don't actually think about it, um, it can it can pass by unnoticed. So what is the larger is that the larger thesis that you're putting forward in the book? I mean, that it's technology because you also talk about individualism and what you call um, the slow life strategy mm -hmm. as being derivatives of technology. And these are sort of powerful linear forces that have been compounding generation to generation. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it is not just the direct effects of technology. It's also these downstream effects. So I already mentioned individualism. So technology makes individualism possible. It gives people the time and the ability to focus on themselves and the ability to be more independent of others. And, it, you know, individualism has all these downstream effects, which we can get to. And then at technology, also because of better medical care, we live longer lives and healthier lives. And infant mortality is lower. So at times when those things happen, then people tend to make the choice to have fewer children and nurture them more carefully. And what happens is the whole developmental trajectory slows down from infancy to old age. So kids are less independent. Um, teens are less likely to have their driver's license, to get a paid job, to go out on dates. Young adults take longer to marry, to have children, to build a career. And middle-aged people look and feel younger than their parents and grandparents did mm. at the same age. So it's 50 is the new 40 and 60 is the new 50 and so on. Um, and there's actually some truth to that. There's some medical journal 
um, articles showing with biomarkers that middle-aged people actually do look a little bit younger than um, previous generations did at that age. So start with technology and then individualism and slow life strategy. And those three explain so many of the generational differences, really almost all of them. There's a, there is a role for major events that shows up every once in a while, but it, it really is rooted in technology when you look at so many of the individual, dif- the um, individual differences among generations. So I, I want to ask you why you started with silence, the silent generation. Um, and that might, your answer to that might come with the answer to this larger question, which I want to ask you about, which is, when did these trends in technology really begin? Again, you started with silence, mm-hmm. the silent generation, but when are we looking at somewhere in the 1700s? Like when did, have you, have you tried to investigate and did you not go further back because the data wasn't as, mm-hmm. as robust and reliable? Yeah. How would you answer I mean, that? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a lot of it. So, you know, much of what I do is based on these big national surveys that go back decades. And even with the silent generation, that is a shorter chapter because there's not as much data um, that it included the silent generation, which just for context, it's those born 1925 to 1945. A lot of people tell me they've never heard of uh, the silent generation, which is too bad because they were the leaders of the civil rights movement and the feminist movement. They deserve to to uh, have their their place and, and uh, have a legacy. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could absolutely make a case for the effects of technology creating generational differences um, I mean, maybe even further back than the 1700s, but we don't have survey data that goes back that far. And the other reason for starting with the silence is I wanted the book to focus on the six living American generations, at least those with a quorum of living members. So right before the silent generation is the greatest generation who fought World War II, born roughly 1901 to 1924. But the youngest of that generation are almost 100. So there's very few of them left. So so ever since I've been a kid, there's been an understanding of there being other generations, you know, that shows up in media all the time. And you had a sense of, oh, that my parents that grew up in the 60s, they were hippies, they had bell bottoms, et cetera. And you had a sense of of this segmentation. When did we begin to segment people? Like this. So I know that, like, I, I'm pretty sure it was the 1940s when we began to, at least in the scholarship, to do it in a robust way. But were people always thinking about previous generations? And is that, is the answer to that question approximate way of asking yourself, when did these technological shifts begin to impact society so much so that we actually were able to distinguish in our heads between the previous generation and our generation? I mean, there's always been talk of, you know, how generations differ from each other. Um, you know, so, so, I should say too, for context, that um, in this area, it's pretty common for people to quote something that Socrates supposedly said about kids today. And by the mm-hmm. way, that, that quote is apocryphal. Someone made it up um, for a doctoral dissertation in the 1900s. So if you ever see, oh, yeah, people have always been saying this. Well, you know, the quote that his quote to about the written is, his quote about the written word, Plato's quote about writing and how it would distort philosophy? Uh, no, it's a quote about, you know, the young people are lazy and spoiled mm-hmm. or something like this. Um, I haven't memorized one. it because I know it's not true. Um, well, it's it's also, it's always just funny to me in this field how people say, well, pe- haven't people always said that? I'm like, so it might, it might've always been true. I always thought mm-hmm. that was a strange argument. Um, where were, where were we? I got off track there. It, it- it was my question about when did we begin to notice these differences and is that a proximal way of, of thinking about or identifying when these tech, when technology began to meaningfully impact the the change in, in, in generational cultures? Yeah. I mean, I think those impacts have been there for a long time. It's just there wasn't the um, the ability to research it. And there wasn't as much interest for whatever Mm. reason um, before. But, you know, there was certainly interest. I mean, there was certainly the idea that that generation who fought World War II 
was special. Mm. Um, the Silent Generation got their name from a Time Magazine article written in the late 1940s, talking about what distinguished that group of young people. So that interest has been around for a long time. Um, but I think it probably really took off with the baby boom because that's mm. a generation who's very demographically defined and just given their large size and large impact, I think you, you can probably trace the modern interest in generational differences to mm. the baby boom and trying to understand that generation. So let's start look with the silent generation because one of the things I learned in reading the book is that a lot of the changes that we associate with the baby boomers actually started with the silent generation. Mm -hmm. So what is most important for us to understand about this cohort? So there's there's a number of things. I mean, they're they're a very interesting generation because they, they got their name from just kind of flying under the radar. So they're sandwiched between the greatest generation fighting World War II. So they were too young to have done that. But then they weren't the baby boom generation that got all of the attention, even from birth. But they did marry young and have their children young. And I think that's where their name really comes from, the idea that they weren't rocking the boat, they were just very domestic. But it ended up in the long run being a pretty spectacular misnomer because yeah, they were the leaders of the civil rights movement. They were the leaders of the feminist movement. Um, they were the leaders of the early gay rights movement. And that's often associated with boomers. But if you look back at the history, the boomers were really, they were too young to be the leaders in those in those movements. And sometimes when I think about the silent generation and their impact, you can think about the arguably the two most famous members of the generation, Martin Luther King Jr. and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And you think about those two individuals and then their impact, you know, you can see that this was a generation who was far from silent. Also, Bob Dylan was a silent generation, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Which is wild, right? Like that's yeah. the last one I would have expected. Yeah. Actually, there were some. You have a list in the book of people mm -hmm. that come from, which I actually thought was very interesting and useful. To and I was surprised to see that uh, Brad Pitt and who else was also a baby boomer. I was surprised that Brad Pitt was a baby boomer, but also you know all these people that look so young now. That's to your point. Yeah. So. Go ahead. Did you want to say something? No, no, no. That was it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, I mean, some of it is because admittedly the generational cutoffs are somewhat mm -hmm. arbitrary. And so there are people who have said, no, you know, the baby boom actually begins with those born in around 1943 instead of 1946, you know, drawing the line at, say, making an argument for culture rather than for, you know, just the demographics of it beginning in 1946. Mm. Um, but even, even if you allow for that and you think about the people born in the 1930s and their impact, you can still see the silent generation, you know, being the leaders of, you know, those equality movements. So I'd like to try and, um, to the extent possible, sort of delineate the changes that happened from generation to generation that drove the the cultural changes. The, so the, the were there certain technologies that you looked at? Um, was it possible to think of it that way that influenced the silent generation? And how did we begin to see changes in 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 their relationship to themselves, to with individualism, and what we t talk about as the slow life strategy? Where did we begin to see these with the silent generation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the biggest impacts for silence is you started to get um, more, you're part, as part of the slow life strategy and technology, more education. So it's easy to forget this in current times, that for that generation who fought World War II, it was not necessarily the norm to even finish high school. It was really common in that generation to not finish high school. And with the silence, that became the norm. And then more started to go to college as well. So the kind of beginning of that modern thinking about the education that you're supposed to finish and that you have to finish in a more technologically complex society really started to get going with the silence. But they also married very young and had their kids young. So they, um, you know, the, the slow life strategy piece wasn't completely linear in the way that it rolled out. It had, you know, a few kind of fits and starts before you got to the full acceleration of, of, of uh, everything 
you know, slowing mm. down. One of the things that I thought was probably the most interesting thing about the silent generation is their mental health, mm -hmm. which actually opens up a, a good opportunity to ask you about how reliable is this data? Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of this is self-reporting, but then you also have objective measures like suicides. So what do we know about the their mental health and how um, how stable has that been over the course of their lives? And what can we infer from that? Yeah. Yeah. So the silent generation really stands out for having fairly robust mental health compared to the generations on either side of them. So um, some of the surveys about having, um, you know, struggling with poor mental health show that the suicide data shows that. And I think the, the easiest way to think about that is, well, they didn't fight World War II. They didn't have the PTSD from that. The baby boomers had their own challenges in terms of a changing culture and silence. Some people have called silence the good times generation. So they kind of managed in a lot of ways to, even though they had their upbringing in the great depression, world war II, when they were young, it was that post-war era when things were um, pretty positive in a lot of ways. So it was not kind of in every way. Yeah. I mean, you could see it in that way that, you know, but they they were young adults during that great economic expansion in the post-war period, which, um, you know, although it wasn't, it was not all positive, especially for women, especially for Black Americans. Um, you know, I think you can't paint the 1950s as a complete utopia for those reasons alone, but it, it was certainly a, a time of a lot of optimism and economic growth in the United States. And they, they enjoyed that time. And they have carried that with them their whole lives is the interesting thing. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, the silence were at the greatest risk. You know, they are and were the senior citizens who were at the greatest risk of hospitalization and death from COVID. Still, they were the least likely um, to say they were anxious and depressed during that time in the big surveys. So that gets us to the next question of how reliable, you know, is, is that data? Well, what's sometimes speculated is, oh, you know, more recent generations are willing to talk about these issues or admit to them. Well, these are anonymous surveys first. So that takes a little bit of the steam out of that argument. But if that was the case, then why would we get a curve? You know, because the silence actually reported fewer days of poor mental health than the greatest generation, even when you take age into account. So that's not a straight line. The other thing is, you know, I've looked at mental health in every chapter for every generation and very consistently that self-report data lines up with the data that we have on more objectively measured behaviors that are relevant for mental health. So suicide, self-harm, you know, like emergency room admissions for self-harm, things like that. Um, it, it really... For the, I mean, I can't think of an instance where those two were, were misaligned, meaning that that self-report data seems pretty reliable when you compare it to the behavioral data. So what were the, the, um, the big differences between the silent generation and the baby boomers? Because it, it seems like, having read your book, one of those was individualism. That individualism, even though the silent generation – was more individualistic than the greatest generation, mm -hmm. that the difference between that previous generation and the baby boomers was much larger. So what what were those big ones, including individualism, and what explains that divergence? Yeah, so I think that that really is um, one of the biggest differences. So individualism says we're going to focus more on the self, less on others. So what you get from that, for one thing, is more equality, regardless of background you get um, much more freedom. So for example, that premarital sex is fine, um, that it's fine for say a woman to be a single mother. Um, divorce is more acceptable. And these are all things that were really a huge sea change in um, the 20th century and really start to distinguish greatest generation from silence from boomers, that that's really that transition over that time was the changes in a lot of those attitudes. What's what, what's this is another thing that I enjoyed in reading the book 
which is that the trends that affected one generation manifested in a different way for the following generation. So of course, one of the the common stereotypes of, the, of Gen X was that they were latchkey kids. They were kids who came home. A lot of them, their parents were divorced. Um, and that was a big thing that affected their life as kids. And of course, that related to the to the rise in divorce and acceptability of divorce in the baby boomer period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although the thing that I do point out about the whole idea of latchkey kids, that wasn't completely unique to Gen X. Um, that that trend of um, more mothers being in the workplace started when the baby boomers were kids. Mm. And it did continue with, with Gen X. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is even more mothers were working when it, when millennials were the kids. It's just at that point, the society finally figured out that, wait a second, more mothers are working. It took them a couple of decades to catch up. Um, and then there were more child care and after school programs yeah. available. So one more question about individualism um, before I ask you a, a separate question about the influence of media. Um, so how do we... How do we quantify something like individualism? It's such a fuzzy term. Um, how confident can we actually feel that one generation is more or less individualistic than the other? Yeah, so there's there's a number of ways to quantify it. So one is at a more cultural level that you can look at changes in language. So the Google Books database is an amazing resource in this area. So you can look at um, the use in books of words like unique, and identity, and those have gone up. Um, There was a a paper um, by Patricia Greenfield at UCLA a few years ago that found um, in Google Books an decrease in the use of the word give and an increase in the use of the word get. So you can see there you know, much that's a more individualistic way of thinking about things. And so that was that that was fascinating. Uh, and then you can look at individuals. So positive self views, for example, individualism encourages the idea that you should feel good about yourself and have high self esteem. And you can see the rise of self esteem. Um, and then there's a survey of college students where they're asked um, to rate their abilities across certain areas and um, more students in recent years have described themselves as above average on things like leadership ability and drive to achieve and so on. So all of those point in that direction of more individualism Um, and of course the changes in attitudes that I described earlier of the acceptance of premarital sex and single mothers um, and all of those things of more more focus on um, and more focus on equality. I mean, that's the other reason that it's, um, you know, you can make a pretty strong case for individualism going up is the um, just, I mean, the very core idea that your fate shouldn't be determined by your race or your gender, that's individualism. That's one aspect of individualism. So we're going to, I think, now quickly get to the part of the book that I found most interesting because of my age. I was born in 1981, so I was on the cusp of Gen X and Gen Y. And we've done now a number of episodes on um, culture. We did one with Chuck Klosterman in the 1990s. Yeah. Yeah. And that book also made me realize that a lot of what I thought was my sort of culture of you know being a 90s kid – uh, born in the early 80s, a millennial, was actually something that I shared with Generation X, and that we actually had a lot of uh, touch points. Mm-hmm. So my my question about media has to do with how much of our sense of who we are as a generation is influenced by media. And of mm-hmm. course, this also, I mean, this is me try to formulate this. Obviously, the silent generation wasn't as influenced by media Mm-hmm. as we are. And what I, one of the things that really stuck with me in the book, which I had actually heard um, Quentin Tarantino talk about on a podcast with Joe Rogan, was the experience of growing up as a Gen X kid. And he talked about the Saturday morning cartoons that you wrote mm-hmm. about in the book mm-hmm. and all of these uh, media influences. So my first, this is a two-part question. My first was, mm-hmm. how important is media, contemporary media, in influencing uh, a culture sense of 
who they are and how has the nature of that media going from broadcast to now we have, you know, everyone's got their own customized media thing change that. So that's one question. Mm -hmm. And the other question is, how do we delineate between the media of one culture and another? Because I grew up, yeah, sure. I watched, you know, Saved by the Bell and, you know, Ninja Turtles and, um, you know, 90210. But I, I also watched like Weekend, what was it? Weekend at Porky's, not Weekend, something at Porky's. Weekend at Bernie's, maybe? No, not Weekend at Bernie's. It was some okay. <laughs> rated R type stuff that I used to, okay. used to be on late in Greece, and it was 1970s yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff. So right. I remember 70s culture. I remember those kids. I remember the reference to suicides. It was it was in a lot of that sort of mm -hmm. cultural media, even though suicide was not a big thing in my generation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so those are my two questions. One is, yeah. how does media, media itself, contemporary media, influence a, a culture, and how has that changed? And then two, mm -hmm. how do we differentiate between our media and the media that we consume from, from a previous generation, which influences us? Yeah. And I love, I love that question. Cause the, this, the, even though, you know, so much of what I do is the, the church and graphs and so on, by far the most fun I had was writing about the pop culture. Mm. Um, and that, that, that's, um, and I think that's also partially because of my own generation, because I'm a Gen Xer. So, you know, my, my feeling is that Gen Xers and, and maybe that for the first wave of millennials that, that um, you're a part of as well, we're really the last group to experience the, a very unified pop culture and to really define ourselves in terms of mm -hmm. the pop culture that we experienced as children. So boomers had that as well, but they didn't have as much of it. Um, you know, they had a few shows uh, on, on TV that were that catered to children, but by, by the time Gen X came around, there were so many more. And you know, the, our experiences with with television for Gen Xers are just such an integral part um, of our childhood and and adolescence. Um, and I think that that really did change as you know it moved from being there were three broadcast channels mm. to then in the eighties cable. And then the internet and YouTube and everything, and just and it it kind of became much more atomized in a way that I think Generation Z has memes and they have thing a few things that say everybody may have seen this or that video, but it's not it's not the same. I mean, on on TikTok, for example, those streams that algorithm is is for you. You know, it everybody is seeing something a little bit different, and. Even the big shows, you know, on streaming or something that people are talking about, a much smaller proportion of the population has seen those shows than the Saturday morning cartoons or um, the big network dramas like Dallas in the 80s that a huge proportion of people were watching and then talking about, you know, the water cooler at work the next day. So that unified pop culture experience is just not there quite as much anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think Gen X in particular, and maybe the, you know, the early 80s millennials too, are kind of the last to, to really have that experience. I mean, I, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what it's about if it's, if everybody just has this experience because it's just, there's something about reminiscing, but I'm flooded with memories and emotions when I, when I think about something like MTV or Nickelodeon, or I think about going to the cinema, going to the movies and watching back to the future, right. you know, like me media, right. the, so much of our, of the way that our modern society makes sense of itself has been through television and movies, you know? So, um, I'm curious to talk, to understand the, how the big changes in generation X from the millennials, because that was also huge. There were some really big changes, and in some ways, mm -hmm. for the better. You know, um, they like one of the things that I didn't realize when, until reading the book was actually that Generation X came to a, into adolescence at a younger age than their mm -hmm. parents' mm -hmm. generation, um, and so they had actually the longest uh, adolescence because they mm -hmm. they also yeah. came to adulthood much later. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. what were the big changes that happened between? um between the millet between the baby boomers 
and Generation X and what explains those things? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this is one place where that slow life strategy is not completely linear in the way that it that it rolled out across the generations. So between boomers and Gen Xers, there was that shift, especially a lot of stuff around individualism, where um, when it was Gen X, it was the young people, like late 80s, early 90s. There's a lot of violent crime. Uh, the teenage pregnancy rate started to, to really tick up. Um, there was just maybe from lack of supervision or other things, there was just, you know, a lot of kids like getting into a lot of trouble. Um, great media example of this, by the way, is the first couple seasons of, of ER shows a, a lot of this in a way that seems very anachronistic now. What does it show? Uh, and when and when did ER start again? It was like early 90s? It was early 90s. Yeah, early 90s. Uh, and it's- For people don't know, that's like where George Clooney really- Yes. Um, really right. Blew up on the scene. Right. Um, and it's set. So it's set in Chicago. And, you know, it's 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 an emergency room right in in inner city Chicago. So they there's, uh, you know, the 14 year olds who's pregnant and there's the 12 year old who's coming in, um, like hold, holding a gun on on people in the ER. Those are two things that that you know, I recall from, from that. I watched, I rewatched it again recently. And, you know, obviously these are extreme examples, but it captures a lot of the, the very true statistics of some of the things that were going on at the time. So this is what you had for, for and, they, and that was the young people then, that was Gen Xers. Uh, and it was just starting to transition into being the millennials were the teenagers. So um, what you have there is, with boomers, the idea anyway is they had a relatively protected childhood, and then Gen Xers did not. And so what you got with more family dysfunction and divorce and, um, you know, again, more individualistic attitudes around sexuality and so on is adolescents getting into a fair amount of trouble, that they had this these opportunities kind of in quotes, what a teenager would see as an opportunity or an adult would see as a disaster to have sex and get involved in gangs and do all this other kind of stuff. Um, but then, as you mentioned, um, as young adults, on average, Gen Xers, you know, started to push a lot of those milestones, uh, like average age of marriage and having kids and so on later, and more Gen Xers went to college. So yeah, Gen X had the longest adolescence on record basically is what happened because they started their adolescence younger. So their childhood was not as long and then they pushed it, you know, they pushed off adulthood. And then with millennials, things started to click back into a more linear place with the slow life strategy, mm. because as those early nineties pathologies kind of worked themselves out and who knows why, but they did but partially because of the economy and other and, and cracking down on crime and other types of factors then millennials started to have the longer childhood then but kept you know putting off adulthood too and then since millennials that 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 whole life trajectory at a more consistent way has slowed down across the life cycle i remember when i was watching you know tv or taking in media at the time when i was a kid when i was probably like a preteen whether it was 90210 or other programming, there was a sense of danger. There was that constant reference to the, you know, teen girl getting pregnant. Um, and there were suicides, people like killed themselves with guns, like all this stuff yeah. were, was, was referenced when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Was that, was that new? And did that reflect the reality of generation X that mm -hmm. was that what, what we were taking in at that time? I mean, yeah, the, the the suicide piece was was unfortunately new. Although that that did start with boomers, um, but yeah, you know, in the 1950s, for example, suicide was much more a middle age thing. It was extremely uncommon for teenagers and young adults to take their own lives, and then those that started to tick up with the boomers and. Um, at least at the time, you know, reached reached a peak with with Gen Xers in the 90s. And a lot of that was around guns, 
So there actually wasn't a huge change in the suicide rate um, for suicides that did not involve guns. So both suicides and homicides, you know, peaked around that time with just a, a lot of gang activity, a, 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 you know, a lot of drug dealing and a lot of guns. So in the book, you you have these um, life event addendums that you put at the end mm-hmm. of chapters. You did it with uh, the millennial. The, sorry, with you did it with mm-hmm. the with the no, you did it with Gen X, which was nine eleven. I don't know if you did it with the millennial. Well, it's in between the two, and it's right. very much on purpose that it's in between. It's and not with, meant to be with one generation or another. And, and, and with the baby boomers, you did uh, HIV. And my question has to do with how did, did, did you, I mean, because you didn't really write about this in the book, but I'm curious if you've thought about it or if you've read anything about it, which is how the HIV epidemic changed sexual norms and sexual behavior among Generation X versus uh, the baby boomers at a similar age. Because I remember growing up with a fear of getting HIV. We were in school. We we saw that video. I can't remember who the kid was. Famous kid that got it from a blood transfusion. Yeah, uh, Brian Magic, White, I think. The, yeah, yeah. We saw a documentary on him yeah. when we were in class when I was like uh, a fourth grader or third grader or something. Yeah. Um, Magic Johnson also mm-hmm. got HIV. It was scary. So there was a lot of fear in the culture around that, and that's the age at which we came to to be like early teens, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just curious, like um, how that what influence that had. Um, and also do we know anything about how it's, how it influenced gen X and people, even my age long-term in in terms of Mm -hmm. our sexual behavior versus Mm -hmm. the previous generation and this next one? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly, but I think certainly a lot of maybe gen Xers and millennials in particular look, look, uh, back at the history of it and, look at baby boomers uh and blame them for everything maybe blame them for everything including the well no it's not what i was gonna say (laughs) although that does happen um and just and 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 you know you could see that time in the 70s that nobody was worrying about it you know hiv wasn't on the scene so it was you know this like golden era when you know people could have sex and not have to worry about getting something that was going to kill them and you know, I think there there are a lot of people look back at that and 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 you know realize that that was a golden time, at least if that was something you were interested in, was you know uh, having sex with lots of people or even just you know starting a relationship and not saying hey let's we both have to go get tested for HIV, which was absolutely the reality by the time um, you know that was on the scene for Gen Xers and millennials. Yeah. It's wild looking back at certain documentaries that talk about um, the, the sexual practices of baby boomers in the sixties and seventies. And uh, it's just, you know, from what I experienced growing up and all the, the risks to your life that were involved. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, it, it, it was definitely just an unrelatable period of time. So, Again, I, I um I will transition here from Generation X to to the Millennials, and I'll, I just want to say that the the thing that most stood out to me when reading this book, and tell me if I have the stereotype right, is that it does seem that Generation X was also Generation X. Didn't they have more kids than the baby boomers? Yeah, which was a surprise to me when I found that data. Yeah. Now, was that how much of that is a result of the longer period of adolescence, the fact that they were sexually active for a longer period of time? At least some of it is probably due to, you know, yeah, not a great reason that there was there were a good number of Gen Xers that got started, you know, having kids as kids as teenagers. So some of it is due to that. But I don't think that's all of it. I think it's also partially the way um, that for Gen Xers, it was. I I was going to say arguably, but I I really think so. I think for Gen Xers, it was easier for women to both work and have kids than it was for baby boomers. There was more childcare available. It was more acceptable. It it wasn't, you know, as unusual um, to be a working mother for Gen Xers as it was for boomers. Um, Even though it's easier for millennials and we've had fewer children, but there are other. Yes. And we can talk about why that might be the case. Um, But it, it, just reading, and I did that for this book and I had done it before, the accounts of boomer women 
to the generation before me, it has just always struck me how they had to really trailblaze in so many ways that they really had to swim upstream so often against the attitudes that they were encountering, particularly if they had children. So was Murphy Brown Gen X or Boomer? I would assume Boomer. She was a Boomer. And that's that's an example. Or like the other movie. What was the movie with... Uh, it wasn't called Working Girl, was it? It was the movie with... with uh, um, Oh, why well, am I blanking now? Who were the? It was I don't think Bette Midler was in it. It was um, the famous uh, musician with the big chest. What's her name? <laughs> Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. <laughs> and, nine, uh, to five. nine to five. Nine to five. Nine to five is right. a nine great example. Five. I don't know why. Of course, I know who Dolly Parton is, and I don't know why I got stuck. But sometimes yes. when you're interviewing someone live, and your brains get stuck in a <laughs> panic attack, and you can't remember yes. the rest no, of it. Yes. No, not nine to five is a great. That's a great example of um. Yeah, the attitudes they encountered and what they had to battle against. Um, Anna Quinlan has written about this as well. I I found some of her columns um from from the eighties uh, and some of the stuff that she describes. Uh, I mean, just the stuff that people would say to her when she was pregnant and just amazing. And just, just, it just amazes me. What, yeah. what, uh, what, what women put up with. Another interesting thing is the inversion of mental health outcomes when you compare Gen X to millennials. So mm-hmm. Gen X, as you said, the stereotype and also the numbers, some of the statistics show that yeah. there was an unusual amount of mental health issues at a very young age. Yeah. But as they went into adulthood, Generation X seems to have done actually rather well and defied some expectations. Where yeah. it was with millennials, it was the opposite. Yeah. Millennials had a very happy, sort of innocent yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1990s childhood. No real, nothing to really be anxious about. Everything was great. America won the war, the Cold War. Um, you know, everything was about getting more, making more money, more efficiencies. We had the 1990s tech boom. It was going to, everything was going to be great. And the nineties, the two thousands turned out to be a difficult period. And a lot of millennials developed a lot of mental health issues later in their, in their life. So what, what explains that, 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 and let's compare both of these generations, Mm -hmm. millennials and Gen X, what, what compares the inversion there? Yeah. Yeah. And so this is where there's the interplay between the generation and then the time period and the how those two interweave in complex ways that are sometimes you know hard to, to separate. But that is really, really what you see of difficult adolescence for Gen X. And then in in adulthood and middle age, Gen X looks about the same as boomers, sometimes better better in terms of the suicide rate, better in terms of a couple measures of depression than boomers at the same age. And then, yeah, millennials, very happy, optimistic, you know, much happier than, than uh, Gen X was at the same age, high in life satisfaction. There were, you know, a few things around some psychosomatic symptoms of depression that didn't look so great, but most things like overt depression, suicide rate, all of that stuff went down between Gen X and millennials when we're thinking about teens and, and young adults. What's interesting for millennials is that even though the 2000s was a really tough decade, that's actually not when mental health issues started to really crop up for millennials. You'd think it, that would be the case, say the, the Great Recession. And there's a small uptick in mental health issues among millennials as young adults during the Great Recession, but it's small. And then it resolves itself pretty quickly. It wasn't until about 2015 you started to really get um, more mental health issues showing up among millennials. And it's it's a little bit of a mystery why that's the case. Um, I, I didn't really come to a definite conclusion in the book about what might have caused that because there's not one clear explanation. Could it be that they were not achieving certain life goals that they expected to around that period of time? Because that's around the time that a lot of them would have gotten to or past 30. Maybe. Uh, but it wasn't true for the first wave of millennials born in the early 1980s. So they, you know, were 30 around, help me out, because you're that uh, age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 2011, uh, 11. 2012, right. 2013. And so it doesn't really show up there. It's not till a little bit later 
And this looks like a little more of a time period effect. It's, if there's some delay in it, kind of staggers by um, age group a little bit, but it really isn't until about 2015. And the other aspect of that is millennials have actually done pretty well financially and in terms of home ownership, even that's very much contrary to the common narrative. So at least on average, I, I don't think that can necessarily ex explain the the uptick in mental health issues. At first, I thought it might, yeah, like you're saying, maybe higher expectations, even if you did do well, it couldn't possibly fulfill the high expectations um, that millennials had. But if that were the case, you'd think that first wave of millennials then maybe, yeah, hit 25 or 30 and it would show up, but it doesn't. It doesn't show up for a couple more years. So I was shocked by that. And I think a lot of people will have just heard you say that and be like, huh, what? Right, right. So I, I'm not shocked that by the income numbers, but I am confused a little bit by the the wealth numbers that they've mm -hmm. done so well by wealth. Now, mm -hmm. let's take yeah. housing, for example. Yeah. You, you, home ownership, that doesn't take into account how much of that debt of the debt of that house has been financed. I mean, how much of the ownership of that house has been financed at what percentage, right? Because I presume that Gen Xers had put more down and um, owned more of the house to begin with than millennials did. Do you have, do you have any information on how much of their, uh, how much of their assets have actually been financed through debt? Well, I mean, what we do have information on is wealth that takes debt versus into assets into mm -hmm. account. So uh, the federal reserve of St. Louis does research into this, into generational wealth building, and they made headlines, um, five or six years ago saying that um, Gen Xers might, I mean, sorry, millennials might be a lost generation when it came to wealth, that they weren't going to do as well as their parents, that they had really fallen behind. They were using data from like 2014, 2015, um, when, you know, well after the Great Recession, but, you know, still that was a big hit. Millennials had really hadn't had time to recover, but then their incomes took off. Um, and in the most recent data, Millennials are neck and neck with Gen Xers at the same age in terms of wealth and are on track to catch up to boomers. So given that that takes into account, you know, debts, including student debt versus assets that suggests they're right there with Gen Xers. I, I'd want to, I mean, I, I don't know that we'll be able to do that here, but it would be worth digging into that more to try to understand it because- while I am skeptical and I'd want to actually see how they came up with those numbers, I do think there's something to be said about expectations. Mm -hmm. And you talk about that in the book, which is the high expectations that millennials had. I ha I certainly had very high expectations as a kid, so I can relate to that. And I can see how um, the, 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 this one's subjective sense of how he or she is doing can be greatly out of step with the you know objective reality. Um so I'm going to move us to the second hour of the conversation, Dr. Twangy, and this is where I really want to start delving into the technological effects on not just mental health, but on the generations overall. And the two generations where this has been the most um, meaningful and we have the most amount of data around it are millennials and especially Generation Z, which of course you've written about. Mm -hmm. And that's going to also give us a chance to think about where we go from here, what the long-term consequences of the trends that we're seeing right now are, and how reliably can we extrapolate from those current trends. And that's something that you spend some time in the book doing. And I actually have a question, some questions for you that weren't in the book, you know, that extrapolate further. When we talk about political extremism, what does that mean for, I mean, we had domestic terrorism in the 1970s. Is that something that we might see again more of? I'm also curious, again, going with a lot of the themes that we talk about on this show, foreign policy, I'm actually, I don't really know much about what the views of Generation Z are when it comes to foreign policy. Do they have any? They're very political. A lot of their ideas are very much around, you know, domestic policy. But I, I mean, I have so many questions like this. I mean, you write about, you know, religion, um, race relations. Big Pharma is another one. And, you know, that made me think about psychedelics which is like psychedelics have made a big comeback. They really help with mental health. And I wonder if we might be on the cusp of some kind of potential um, liberalization of psychedelics or the 
proliferation of their use that could have maybe positive effects on a kind of transformation of consciousness. So I, in other words, even though there are certain trends, I feel like there are certain things that could interrupt those trends. And I'd like to explore all those things with you. For anyone who is new to the... <clears throat> For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Dr. Twangy, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Dr. Twangy, stick around. We're going to move the second hour of our conversation onto the premium feed.